it, so call me back. Okay, I love you. What's up, you guys, and welcome back to Emotionally Online, the show for spilling guts and sharing secrets, hosted by yours truly, the one and only Maddie Drosbeck, who at this present moment is no closer to discovering if I really should be laundering my pillows or not. Not the pillowcases, the pillows themselves. It brought me so much relief to read through your comments on last week's episode because the vast overwhelming majority maybe even all of you I don't even know that I read a single comment of someone being like you don't want your pillows like I feel like if everyone was in mutual agreement in the comments being like I was supposed to be fucking doing that and in fact I saw some people being like this is fake news this is completely made up actually I don't think that you should be laundering your pillows because how are you going to dry them completely it sounds like a mold problem and some people were saying that they tried to launder their pillows and that's exactly what happened to them so you know I felt completely seen understood and validated in that moment so I just like to shout out everyone in the comment section of last week's episode entertaining me on the subject of cleaning TikToks and laundering your fucking pillows I think the conclusion I've come to within myself is that I actually don't give a fuck what I'm supposed to be doing um I have chosen not to do it this is a this is a point of cleaning that I've decided not to take part in I will wash my pillowcases like the rest of everyone else uh, but I will not be throwing my pillows themselves in the washing machine thank you very much I'm so sorry if this disappoints you I just don't intend on doing it I really do when I said that I was like listen I've had the same two pillows on my fucking bed since I was like 11 years old and I've never done anything to them I meant that and also I feel like if something bad was going to happen to me because of that it would have happened already but it hasn't and I've been completely fine all these years I, I, I I've been blissfully ignorant to even knowing that I that there was someone out there that thought that I should be doing that and thank god I've now learned that there are so many people out there that think that I shouldn't be doing it and that this is apparently a point of conflict. Happy to be in the middle of it. Happy to discover that most people are not laundering the pillows themselves. don't like flat pillows I kind of do I feel like my neck just hurts if it's not like a flat ass pillow so I love those pillows from my fucking childhood that I still sleep with because they, they like barely exist they're like goose feather pillows that are thin as hell and I've been sleeping on them since I was just a wee little girl so I'm not getting rid of them I'm sorry I'm also not throwing them in the wash I'm just not doing all that you have fun though. You have fun doing that. I will not be. Okay, you guys, it has been an absolutely monumental week in terms of pop culture. There's so much to discuss. Obviously, the Oscars happened this week, um, which huge. So much to talk about there. I did host an Oscars watch party with my friends directly after the trivia championship, which we did qualify for and we played in. It was a lot of fun, if you were wondering. Anyways, back to the Oscars. Hosted a little Oscars watch party, and before they started, all of us filled out ballots uh, for what our predictions were for each of the categories. Not what we wanted to happen, but what we thought would most likely happen. And of the 23 categories, I guessed 18 of them correctly. I was like, I kind of slayed. I kind of ate that one up. I had watched all of the best picture nominations before they even announced that they were nominations. I thought I was so prepared to like have the nominations come out and be like, yeah, and I'm going to grind to watch all of them. No, when they came out, I had already seen all of them and was like, damn, I'm really fucking ahead of it this year. I don't think that's ever happened in the history of any Oscars season ever where I had seen every best picture beforehand. Um, and then I tried to watch a bunch of the other, films that were nominated in other categories I did watch the um live action shorts I didn't watch the animated shorts I didn't watch the documentaries I didn't watch the documentary shorts but pretty much all the other categories I'd seen all the movies in most of there's some that I didn't um but yeah the ones that I didn't see any movies in were the animation and documentary categories um 
despite that fact, I did still guess both of the documentary categories correct and the animation shorts correct. I guessed feature animation incorrectly. I guessed Spider-Man ended up being Boy and the Heron, which I heard great things about both of them. But yeah, I was completely going in blind. I was basing my guesses for the categories that I had seen nothing in uh, off strictly like letterbox reviews and what I had seen people writing about the movie over the course of the year. I love letterbox. I actually feel like I have gone to work for this fucking app. I'm in the walls. I've penetrated them at their core. All right. I wake up every morning and I think to myself, I have to get on letterbox. I have to open up my fucking app and see what movies the people were watching while I was slumbering, while I was sleeping, what opinions were being posted to this godforsaken application. I don't even follow that many people on the app because I don't even know that many people that use letterbox which is a tragedy in and of itself and I have at gunpoint forced a lot of my friends to download Letterbox. Letterbox, I've been going to work for you. Actually, I'm fully employed by Letterbox and they don't pay me. <laughs> okay? I've been on your app for years and then I encourage everyone to get on your app whenever I go to see a movie with my friends. I, I leave, I rank the movie and write my little review immediately and then I sit there refreshing it, waiting for my friends to add their reviews. And if they don't add them, guess who follows up? I send a fucking text to my friends and I'm like, mm, so I noticed you didn't log your review. I'm like, I've only been sitting on my couch fucking waiting to hear your opinions. I only like cherish every word that comes out of your mouth to like the highest degree, okay? I've been sitting on your letterbox profile just waiting to hear what you thought of this movie. It's actually important to me review the fucking movie at gunpoint. I'm telling you, I make my friends do this. And I say, please, please review the movie. And when people have been critical of Letterboxd, guess who comes to their defense? Me, bitch. <laughs> people are like, I don't get how to use this app. It's so hard to use. I'm like, no, actually, you're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Except there are some parts of the app that I have criticisms for that I will allow. But overall, I think it is a pretty fantastic app and I do think it makes a lot of sense have I also been using it since like 2017 so I've had time to get used to the interface absolutely I have but all things considered I think it's pretty good and I will go to their defense and I do think that more people should be on letterboxd and more people should be reviewing movies and letting me read those reviews so anyways let's talk about the Oscars <laughs> Now, obviously, going into this award season, everyone kind of knew that Oppenheimer was going to sweep. Now, would Oppenheimer have swept if it was Maddie Drospeck's Oscar night? No, it would not have. Now, that's not shade to the movie because I actually did enjoy Oppenheimer. I gave it four out of five stars. So clearly, I did enjoy myself. I saw Joss Peck slam that button and I was like, he knew what he was doing. I liked Oppenheimer. I can recognize a great movie when I see one. It doesn't mean that it's going to be like my personal cup of tea. So it's like Oppenheimer was a great movie. Christopher Nolan, very talented director. Christopher Nolan directed one of my personal favorite movies, Memento. Much respect, can recognize greatness when I see it. Was Oppenheimer my personal favorite movie for sure? No. If it was up to me, up to me and only me, <laughs> Saltburn would have been nominated, bitch. <laughs> So we don't even, you and I don't have to have the same tastes, okay, to any film bros watching this. I went to college with you, and I don't care. And I liked Saltburn. <laughs> <laughs> that was my best picture, it was, of last year. And fucking haters be gone. You guys just don't get it, and I'm done talking about Saltburn. I promise to never talk about Saltburn ever again. Maybe. Um, of the best picture nominations, Poor Things was obviously my favorite of the bunch. Poor Things was my second favorite movie of the year, just behind Saltburn, and I think it is just an absolute masterpiece. I think Emma Stone was brilliant, and her portrayal of Bella Baxter just completely moved me. Um, I, I, in one of my vlogs on my YouTube channel, I had recorded myself right when I came home from the theater after seeing Poor Things for the first time, and I cried. I was so moved by her portrayal of the character, and, um, just the whole the whole fucking movie it's brilliant and it's so well written and it is beautiful poor things also did really well at the oscars night they won for 
quite a few things. I believe they won for costuming. They won for hair and makeup. I believe they also won for production design. I could be messing that up, but I do believe that they won for that. Poor Things did great. Um, it just would have also been my personal best picture. It just is so brilliant. I've seen more and more criticism for Poor Things, and half of it, I, I read it, and I'm like... Not that I think that everyone needs to like the movies that I like, okay? But what I will say is that I think some of the criticism I've seen for Poor Things, to me, I'm like, did you watch the same movie as me? Like, did you miss the entire point of the movie? All the reviews that are like, this movie's anti-feminist, I'm like, what? Like, I'm sorry, what movie did you go fucking watch? Because <laughs> that's like... Yeah, I just feel like you're missing the entire point of the movie. I also will say that I think that we're in a weird timeline right now with like media literacy where a lot of times people will watch a movie and be like, this character is a bad person and therefore this movie shouldn't have been made. This character did something bad. This character behaves in such and such a way and I don't like them and therefore how dare they make this movie or they think that like the worst characters in the movie are a reflection of what the director thinks or what the writers think. It's really weird. I, I feel like I could talk about media literacy like on a loop because I actually think it's like a huge problem <laughs> and I think that it's perpetuated by um, a lot of like short form analytical uh, film criticism content that we see on like TikTok. I, I think with that and like the lack of media literacy being paired with the fact that we're in a time where um, people take short videos they see on TikTok as being like a genuine news source and like um, point of fact. Like the amount of people that decide they dislike something that they've never even seen just because they saw someone on TikTok speak to them condescendingly like they're a know-it-all that knows everything and be like, this thing is bad and I know it's bad because eh, they don't even watch the thing. They're just like, I heard a know-it-all say that it sucked on TikTok so I'm going to tell everyone else that it's bad and they shouldn't watch it and how dare they. <laughs> and it's perplexing to me not saying that everyone needs to like poor things but to call it like an anti-feminist film just feels like you're completely missing the point um it, which is confusing to me personally um because I was very inspired by this film and I thought that it was wonderfully done and it tackles so much of the experience of womanhood and being over sexualized from a young age and you know approaching the world with such a sense of curiosity and wonder and having that like smashed out of you because of how the world treats young women so I don't know I also think that people have a hard time like suspending disbelief for a few moments and being like this movie is set in a world unlike our own um as far as I know they're not putting the brains of children into young women and just testing it out and seeing how it goes um so I'm sort of like what's going on when people are judging the like mere concept of the film through the lens of like uh what is culturally acceptable in 2024 in the United States also it's made up also we're not supposed to like a lot of the male characters and poor things. And I thought that was obvious. I don't know why people think you have to like all of the characters in order for it to be a good movie or, or that it's like, it, it is a bad, toxic, harmful thing to have, uh, bad characters in movies. It's weird. It is strange to me. I was really personally very moved by poor things and by Emma Stone's portrayal of Bella as I think, the overwhelming majority of people who watched the movie were. I, I'm just focusing on the little bit of criticism that I have seen from people, but it, it is hard for me not to see the like criticisms of um, f how feminism is discussed in poor things as being like, wow, you missed it went over your head completely. Like you just fucking missed the whole point of the movie. And um, yeah, cause I just felt so very much the opposite. I, I thought that it was, uh, a, a really wonderful film for talking about and addressing um, 
like what it's like to be a, a woman growing up and approaching the world with this sort of like curiosity and wonder and then being um, told what to do and over sexualized and having your autonomy stripped from you every chance that other people, every chance that men get to take it from you they do and like learning how to grow up in a world that is constantly trying to stifle you and and, and I don't I I thought that it was like the perfect portrayal of all of that I felt so moved by it and moved by the character moved by Emma Stone's performance of it um I thought Mark Ruffalo was great as well it's the whole thing is just phenomenal I could talk about poor things on a loop but um I get that not everyone's gonna love it not everyone's gonna resonate with it but to to say that the movie was like harmful or toxic is like so far beyond the scope of what I am willing to listen to. I just am like, huh? Like you for sure didn't watch the same movie that I watched. But I also think again, this connects to the media literacy thing where we're in an age right now where on TikTok, a lot of people for whatever reason conflate like, the worst characters in a movie with the opinions of the director and the writers or people can't witness um a a shitty character a flawed character without being like and this movie is bad because they included that flawed character like that it's kind of the point and I, I I don't I feel like people get hung up on that and they're like this character is bad and therefore the movie is bad and it's toxic and it promotes something negative and I'm like I mean, we weren't supposed to like that character. We weren't supposed to agree with them. And I'm not sure why. Yeah, it's very confusing to me. And it's something I see a lot in like TikTok movie reviews. I'm like, you don't have to like the movie. It doesn't have to be your cup of tea. But to take it to the extent of being like, this is harmful and bad because this character is bad. I'm like, that's the point. That's the point. (laughs) Whatever. So if it were up to me, if it was my ballot, if it was I was the only one controlling this, I personally would have given it to Poor Things. But I did really like Oppenheimer. Poor Things, I gave five out of five stars. I'll go through my opinions on all of the Best Picture nominees. Poor Things, perfect movie to me. Five out of five stars, no notes. Right behind Poor Things for me was The Holdovers. I also thought The Holdovers was absolutely fucking phenomenal. Dominic Sessa, I am so excited to see what he does next I can see him being like such a powerhouse the fact that this was like his debut role is really impressive to me I've been keeping up okay I check his Instagram I see what he's doing I've seen all his little red carpet looks okay the photo shoots he's been doing I'm keeping up okay Dominic Sessa we've got our eye on him because I think he's gonna do great things but holdovers moved the fuck out of me that was like an instant Christmas classic to me I think I will rewatch the holdovers every single year I think that I will get older and tell my nieces and nephews like it's a required watch the same way my dad forces me to watch it's a wonderful life which I'm sorry to all the it's a wonderful life lovers I do not like that movie I find it so boring um but I'm gonna do that to whatever young children my siblings conjure up and I'm gonna make them watch the holdovers because it's a banger of a movie and I also love Paul Giamatti and Devine Joy Randolph who very deservingly won best supporting actress for her role in the holdovers which I was stoked on because she absolutely deserved that so loved the holdovers after the holdovers my order goes anatomy of a fall Barbie American fiction Oppenheimer um all four of those movies I ranked four stars anatomy of a fall I loved uh that that dog deserved a fucking Oscar I was scared I was trembling I don't actually even want to know how they got that dog to do that um Barbie I feel like I had similar opinions to what a a lot of people said in the aftermath of Barbie coming out um maybe I'm more middle ground between the like two groups of people that had harsh opinions on Barbie I felt similarly that I did about past lives that I did about Barbie where I I felt like I would have liked it more had I not had the movie like super hyped up for certain aspects that I didn't fully agree with. Um, Like Barbie, first of all, I saw it the first week that it opened and I loved it. I thought it was cute and fun and girly and just a good time. It was a good 
fucking time. Barbie. Cute. Loved it. Had a great time. But by the time that I saw Barbie, it was after like a week of everyone being like, I was sobbing the whole time. That's like the best, most feminist movie I've ever seen in my life. I felt so moved by it. Like, I'm losing my mind. I've never seen anything like this before. And so when I was watching it and I was remembering that I had heard all of those things about it, I was like, really? That was the takeaway? Because I just didn't really agree but here's the thing is I didn't have to I don't think Barbie needed to be that Barbie was baby feminism to me and it makes sense because it's Barbie it was not meant to be like this like really earth rocking never been done before level analysis on what it means to be a woman like I don't I don't think that that was the intention of the movie I think that it was baby feminism and it was supposed to be because it was Barbie so I thought that it was fantastic because it did exactly what it was meant to do. Would I have been struck by this movie when I was 14? Absolutely. When I was 14, first thinking about, you know, feminism and what it meant to be a woman, I would have ate this up. It would have been profound and monumental to me. But I saw a lot of, like, grown adults being like, this was next level, which, yeah, I didn't agree with. I think my take on Barbie was like I felt I was sort of in the middle of the two groups you had the people that were like all about Barbie and were like this movie did something totally different and I sobbed and it's like starting a conversation in a way that it's just never been done before like it just captured what it means to be a woman in such a perfect way there were people that were like way on that side of things and then there were other people that were like this was stupid and like baby feminism derogatory (laughs) and I was in the middle of those two groups where I was like yes it is baby feminism but I think it was supposed to be it's a movie about Barbie like I didn't go to the Barbie movie thinking I was gonna have the most profound experience of my entire life clearly some people did good for them I guess it would have been that profound to me if I was 14 I was like yeah it's not the most like profound thing ever but I don't think it's supposed to be it's a movie about Barbie this is like baby feminism 101 and it's cute and fun and silly and we have Ryan Gosling as Ken Margot Robbie as Barbie like I just felt like it did exactly what it set out to do and I think that some people overhyped it on one end and some people overhyped it on the other end and I was sort of like I think we need to meet somewhere in the middle of both of these things right? Overall, I really enjoyed Barbie. I thought it did exactly what it needed to do. Was it the most inspirational movie to me? No, (laughs) for sure. No. But, um, yeah, like I said, I don't think that was the intention of the movie. So I enjoyed it. I gave it four stars. I would watch it again. I enjoyed myself. I loved the Barbie movie. There we go. Then from there, I would rank past lives. I did really love past lives. I know that I've talked about past lives a bunch, but I've mostly talked about it in the sense of like how people were like, this is the best romance movie I've ever seen. The love story is crazy. And then I watched it and I was like, the love story. What the fuck were you guys on? <laughs> like I just, that's not how I, uh, experienced that movie. I did love past lives though. So I gave that three and a half stars. And then remaining here I've got Killers of the Flower Moon and The Zone of Interest both of which I gave three stars I liked both of those movies as well again I really there's only one best picture movie that I didn't like (laughs) and it's the only one I haven't talked about yet um but I liked Killers of the Flower Moon I liked The Zone of Interest um I would love to watch The Zone of Interest again knowing what I know now about the movie I think learning more about the production aspect of it and learning that it was shot in a really interesting way and I'm probably gonna butcher explaining this but basically they it wasn't like they had one camera that was like all right and action go and then we get our shots and then we move to the next um to the next uh shot the next cut whatever they had a bunch of cameras set up throughout the house and the like surrounding property that they were shooting at and they shot the majority of the movie all at one time so like while we're having some of the inside scenes happening simultaneously there are scenes happening outside and they're all shooting them at once it's like a immersive filming experience I learned that only after I had watched the movie and I wish I had known that before I watched the movie because that is so fascinating and I would have loved to just have that little 
fun fact about the movie in my brain while I'm watching it. So I really want to watch Zone of Interest again, knowing what I know now. Here's the things I wish some of like the the like behind the scenes facts on like how they shoot certain movies or why directors make certain choices make the viewing experience so much more fun to me. I like wish I don't know. I feel like I'm all in like researching every movie I go see before I see it. So I'm like, I missed this. Like they need to make these fun facts more available to me because I would have loved to know that before seeing the movie, but I'll go see it again. Eventually. My thing is that I don't like rewatching movies so soon after I saw it for the first time. I need like a breath in between watching movies again. Um, so it'll probably be a minute until I actually go watch it again, but someday I will watch Zone of Interest for a second time. Zone of Interest did end up winning Best International Feature, which I thought was fantastic. And um, Jonathan Glazer, who's the director of Zone of Interest, when he was accepting the award, he made it very clear that the things that we witness and feel as an audience watching Zone of Interest are the same things that we should feel right now watching what's going on in Palestine, which I thought was a very important and um, like brave thing to do on the Oscars stage. What we're witnessing in this movie is something that is happening currently in our present day lives. This is not like a piece of history that's never been repeated. It's happening right now, right in front of us. And to 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 bring that up at the Oscars, I thought was just um, huge. It was huge and it was great. Um, so loved Zone of Interest, loved Killers of the Flower Moon. The only movie that I did not like... <laughs> from this year's best picture lineup was Maestro, which I gave a two and a half stars. Here's what I'll say about Maestro. First of all, I probably would have liked it a little bit more if I saw it in theaters because I think the sound on this movie is probably what brings a lot of it to life. Watching it in my parents' living room over Christmas week um, it just wasn't hitting for me like that. I don't know that Bradley Cooper was like slaying in the way he thought that he was slaying. Um, I will say Carrie Mulligan is beautiful and brilliant and she was wonderful, but that's about all I'll say about Maestro. And it was beautiful. The cinematography was great. The like makeup and hair and costuming, the look of it all. It was visually a really beautiful movie and Carrie Mulligan I would die for, that's all I have to say about Maestro, though. I thought overall it was not that great, and I actually don't understand how it was nominated over uh, a, a plethora of other films that came out in 2023. But alas, it did lose everything that it was nominated for. So clearly the Academy agrees, question mark. Why didn't you nominate something better? Who knows? Today, as I'm recording this, right before I went to go get in front of this camera, Charlie XCX dropped a little teaser of the Von Dutch remix featuring Addison Ray that's coming out soon. First of all, how good does it feel to be on the right side of history? To all the Addison Ray defenders out there, how does it feel to be on the right side of fucking history? I actually can't believe, I don't think I've ever talked about Addison Ray on this podcast before, which is crazy to me because I have so much to say about Miss fucking Addison Ray. First of all, first of fucking all, I think. The internet was so unfairly mean to Addison when Obsessed came out. Bear with me. Bear with me because I'm about to spit some absolute facts to you right now. Some of you are unprepared. Some of you are unfucking prepared and you're going to realize right now in this moment that you have been so mean to Addison Rae for no fucking reason at all. First of all, I feel like I'm a defender of any young woman that is shat on for no fucking reason. Addison Rae being one of these people, in my opinion, first of all, when Addison Rae put out Obsessed, people dogpiled on her like no tomorrow. And here's the thing. They, they do that to everybody. Any social media star that decides to pivot to doing something else, whether it's music or acting or whatever. People were always going to look at her and be like, she's talentless. Her management set her up to this. It's a cash grab. Like there's no universe where Addison Rae could just genuinely want to pursue music and have had this interest pre-internet or to have genuinely developed it right now. In the eyes of people on social media, it is always going to look like a cash grab. Like Addison Rae, she's hot. She has a following and her management is just telling her what to do to maximize 
profit here. Get a viral TikTok song. Get more attention. Get more eyes. Someone else is going to write the song, make all the choices for her, put her in the booth and say, good luck. And it's all for cash, whatever. And maybe all of it's true, right? We won't know. But immediately, if someone from social media, particularly someone like Addison Rae, decides to put out a song, they immediately get pigeonholed into like that narrative, that storyline. And maybe it is true. I honestly, I don't personally care if that is true or not. I don't give a single fuck about that. There are a lot of untalented people out there that have put out a lot of, you know, bullshit for money. I'm going to defend Addison Rae, though, in this instance, because when she put out Obsessed, first of all, it's not even that bad of a song. Like, Y'all are going crazy about that, being like, this song sucks, it's such a cash grab, she's so undelated. It's not even that bad of a pop song. Is it my favorite of the Addison Rae discography? Not even close, which we'll get to that. But generally speaking, Obsessed is not even that bad. But what I really want to focus on here is when Obsessed came out, she went on Jimmy, it was either Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel, one of the Jimmys, could give less of a fuck about the Jimmys. But she went on one of their shows and she performed Obsessed. This is where I gained some respect for her. People trolled the fuck out of her for that performance. They were so mean. People made fun of her so much for it. But here's the thing. I have a lot of respect for someone that will get on stage and put on a goddamn performance when they absolutely do not have to. If it was just going to be a cash grab and she was just going to put out this random pop song that she put no effort into um, and then for the rollout, she could have sat on that stage and done nothing and just did her little song, flipped her hair a few times and left. Okay. But she had a whole production going on. She had a ton of choreography. She was fully in it. She was giving pop star Addison Rae from day one, when she released obsessed, it wasn't like, Oh, I'm just going to put out this song and reap the rewards and benefits of it. She was putting in work, bitch. Did you see the way she was dancing? Cause I saw the way that she was dancing. I respect people that go that extra mile to serve us entertainment, to serve us pop star, to serve us cunt. Okay, and Addison Rae was serving cunt. Whether you want to admit it or not, she was. Uh, For as much shit as Addison Rae got during the rollout of her first single, Obsessed, I felt like it was obvious that she gave a shit. That she, whether you like the song or not, whether you think it deserves to exist in the first place or not, she could have done so much less. She could have gave so much less of a shit. But it seemed like she was having a fun time living her pop star fantasy and leaning into like the entertainment aspect of it all, which I liked. I don't even fucking like this song, right? At the end of the day, there's a lot of weird shitty people out there putting out weird shitty music. I thought that this young girl having fun living her Britney Spears fantasy for a minute was just cute and fun. And I had no issue with it. And I was like, go off. Addison Rae Slay. She's having fun. She looks cute. She's fucking nailing this choreography. There's something about her that I like here that I respect. And I don't, I don't know. I also think that people will just shit on anything that a young woman does no matter what. And so I had a lot of empathy for Addison Rae and how people treated her in that era, in that time. And then when her EP came out, first of all, first of fucking all, when Addison Rae's EP finally came out because people basically bullied her into not putting it out. So it came out so much later than it was supposed to because the internet bullied the shit out of this girl. Finally, the EP, she's just like, ah, whatever, puts out the EP. It is banger after banger on that bitch, okay? Some of y'all don't know what you're missing because the Addison Rae EP fucks, okay? We were being fed. Addison Rae was mothering. I always, I throw Addison Rae on all the time. I, I have her on all my little playlists. I am a pop music connoisseur. I love this type of shit. So I have Addison Rae on a bunch of my playlists and my friends will come over and I'll be playing Addison Rae. I can't tell you how many times somebody has looked at me and be like, who is this? And I'm like, you go, you're going to hate when I tell you who this is. Like, you're looking at me right now like, oh, this song is pretty good. Who sings this, Maddie? And you're going to be so mad. You're going to be so mad that you just said that when I tell you who it is that sings a song. And every time I get to be like, it's Addison Rae. I have like a surge of excitement just shoot through my body because it really just like, it is so exciting to me to get to tell someone, yeah. This song that you really like, bitch, it's by Addison Rae. And I'm sure you giggled along when everyone was being a hater to her. But are you, I'm sorry, 
my neck to die for, my legs to die for, this uh-uh sex to die for, I want someone who thinks I'm to die for, banger, featuring Charlie XCX, Charlie, this is why I trust Charlie XCX with my whole being, real, recognize real, Charlie saw it, this woman is brilliant, Charlie saw Addison Ray, all her shit, and Charlie was like, look at this little girl, just like absolutely popping off, Charlie saw exactly what I saw, exactly what us Addison Ray defenders were seeing, all right, she's cutie, she's fun, she wants to entertain, the music is cute, and it's good, and I like it, okay, she was kind of eating and serving and devouring with this fucking EP, i actually get fired up when people talk about how they don't like her because I'm like but why why do you not like her do you not like her just because you're like she's hot and got a lot of followers for doing her little TikTok dances do you just hate her because the internet has told you to hate her because they tell you to hate every young girl that gets a lot of followers on the internet for doing what other people deem as nothing I'm not saying that doing the TikTok dances was the most profound thing ever but act like there's not a shit ton of fucking men on the internet that are famous for no reason also is stupid also you can sit there and be like she's famous for no reason but here she is actually trying to make something that's more meaningful and y'all still hate her so what's what is it what's the truth then I think some people just love to hate people and I think Addison Rae unfortunately got funneled into that like just person you love to hate pipeline super quickly I like the bitch though I'll be honest I just got to say that I think people did Addison Rae dirty and I think people have been quick to judge her and I just completely agree with Charlie XCX's decision to uh, bring Addison Rae along and put her on the fucking remix for Von Dutch which from what I've heard of this remix it sounds fucking phenomenal I love Von Dutch it is one of my favorite songs it is the only song I've been listening to since it came out the Von Dutch remix sounds so good though because it sounds like a a work of art in its own my beef with so many remixes is that they sound like a shittier version of the original song and it's just like okay this is very similar to the song we originally loved it's not different enough and in the ways that it is different it's just worse it sounds like the first draft of what the song ended up being is how I feel about a lot of remixes this is not how I feel about what I've heard from the Von Dutch Addison Ray A.G. Cook remix okay it sounds like a song of its own it is so exciting to me that this remix is going to come out and I'm going to get to relive the vibes of Von Dutch transplanted, surgically removed, and implanted into a brand new piece of music with Miss Addison Ray on it. Oh my God. How lucky are we? And if I see any slander in the comments, I'm literally going to town with you. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> Can we not have fun? Can we not just let Addison Rae prance around and make her fucking music and have a good time with Charlie XCX? Can we not just let her do that and enjoy her while she does it and clap along and be like, and this is silly and girly and fun. Okay, my pop princess Addison Rae, get on the track, mama. I'm over it. I'm over the Addison Rae haters. And the truth is that I've been an Addison Rae defender since day one. And you bitches can track that. <sighs> And I'm just excited for this remix to drop. <laughs> I don't know exactly where to connect this, but I know it connects here somehow. I think that in this era of the internet, people have become so afraid of cringe, so afraid of being cringe, that they are harsher towards people that exhibit like any level of cringe behavior. When honestly, I think that your aversion to cringe is making you uninteresting. Boom. That's my take of the day. <laughs> I've long said that I think that any kind of like successful entertainer has to have like some level of cringe to them. Cause I think like, unfortunately we're living in a timeline where people think that taking yourself seriously and like buying into yourself, backing your own, uh, like passions and, uh, uh, work and whatever backing yourself in that way is cringe to people, uh, which I think is stupid. So I think to be an entertainer of any kind, you have to indulge in some level of cringe. Cause also it's like self-indulgence and being like, I'm creating this thing and I think it's important and I want to put it out there and share it with people and like impact them in some way because of this work of art. I think that 
to somebody out there, if they don't personally like what you're making, if they don't personally resonate with it, that's always going to be cringe to them. Uh, I think that's stupid personally. Also, I think this like aversion to cringe makes so many people know it all. I personally huge fan of cringe. think it's necessary. I think I'm cringe. I think everyone that I respect creatively is cringe. I think... I think that cringe is like a necessary part of being like an authentic person that wants to like back the shit that you're making. I think you have to be cringe in order to be successful in the entertainment business. This really is my hot take of the week. I do not think that cringe is a bad thing. I, I really do believe that it's necessary. And I think the people's aversion to cringe, um, makes them less interesting also, I think these people that have an aversion to cringe are also very quick to call out that something is cringe because I think it makes them feel like they've got like an elevated taste palette. They're able to call out that this is cringe and it's so beneath them. But in reality, I think that when you're so concerned about not being cringe, not being embarrassing, always being like a certain level of taste. But I feel like by leaning into that and accepting that as like the way you want to judge other people, you also end up judging yourself through that lens and simultaneously denying yourself of some of the freedom that you absolutely need in order to create your best work. Is what I'm saying making sense? Because it makes sense inside my own head where I just feel like people that are more concerned about cringe and they have like an aversion to cringe in other people, obviously that reflects within themselves too. And I think that is detrimental for any creative person to be like over consumed with the idea of cringe because I think it's a necessary part of being creative. I really do believe that. All right, let's move on to some audience submissions here, shall we? If you don't know, there is an audience submission box for the show where you can submit anything and everything that you'd like to bring up at the sleepover, all right? Any secrets you want to spill, anything you want to chat through, happy to give advice when my advice is asked for, so feel free to submit to the box and maybe I will read them out on the show. Hey Maddie, I am a big lover of your podcast. The way you see and describe the world and relationships around you fill me with a lot of calmness and gratefulness for kind and loving people. Appreciate you. I am 24 and have recently started to date more queer people and specifically women. I always knew that I was attracted to all genders, but out of heteronormativity, I guess I almost exclusively have been on dates with men. And I'm noticing an interesting shift in the way I approach things. When I went on dates slash wanted to pursue men romantically, I was always quite harsh and fast to distance myself whenever there was something I deemed as unkind or harsh. When somebody was not texting me enough, for example, or was not super clear with me, I would immediately close myself off and distance myself from them. Even though this harshness maybe protected me from hurt, I now, and then as well, realized that this very dump him culture approach to dating and developing relationships is very harmful to me because it lacks the nuance that is needed to form genuine bonds with people. Now, where I am dating more women and generally feel more calm and respected during dates, I actively try to avoid thinking in those black and white ways when it comes to communication. However, now I notice that me forcing myself to give people grace and to be patient with people when they give me unclear signals may be better than writing them off immediately, but it's also starting to hurt me quite a lot. I've been repeatedly in situations where people who I went on dates with respond very late or are very unclear to my questions of them wanting a second slash third date or they cancel on me same day without a lot of explanation and I still let it slide and I'm open to meeting them again because I actively want to be understanding and patient with people in dating. So my question from a very newly found hopeless romantic to a fellow more experienced hopeless romantic, how do I manage to be patient with people and not indulge into dump him culture while also respecting my boundaries and accepting that some behaviors are bad and should be seen as future problems for our relationship? Because right now I'm in the mode of having endless understanding with everyone and I feel it is slowly hurting me. I am sending you lots of love and best wishes. I totally hear you. And I think that, um, dating is all about like discovering yourself, discovering what your boundaries are, discovering what you want, discovering what feels good, discovering what doesn't and learning to sit in the balance of, you know, offering people understanding because we're all going through our own shit on our own timelines. And we want to be able to give people grace and understanding and patience, um, in life in general, while also maintaining firm boundaries and knowing when to walk away when 
uh, something isn't up to standard for us or doesn't make us feel good. I think a good rule of thumb for this and something that I try to remind myself of is that I think that it's good to give people, to give everyone in life a certain level of understanding and patience. However, I do think that extended understanding and patience is something that is earned. I think the same way that trust needs to be earned, I think that like being very generous with our understanding and patience with someone should be reserved for the people that we have um, more in-depth relationships with, where we know they're deserving of that understanding and patience. Like I said, I think that everyone is deserving of a baseline level of understanding and patience, but like Like as an example, let's say we went on one date with someone and it went pretty well and you're open to going on a second date, but following that first date, their, you know, uh, responsiveness in texting drops off immensely. You're trying really hard to make plans for this second date, to get it on the calendar, and they are just impossible to get a hold of. Finally, after, you know, much understanding and patience has already been given, to them on your part you nail down time for that second date and then the day gets here you're getting ready to go on the date and then 30 minutes before the date is supposed to start they text you and they cancel the date I don't think that you need to continue offering them patience and understanding if you don't want to in fact if they're hard to reach out to and make plans with after the first date I don't think you need to be understanding and patient with them then if you don't want to you don't need to do that if you don't want to especially when it's with people that you don't know you don't know their intentions you don't know if this is how they normally act or not and here's the thing if they want to correct their behavior they will if this is a one-time fluke and something crazy popped up and they had to cancel this date last minute If they really want to go out with you and they want to correct that, they will take the initiative to plan the next date and be better at communicating. If it's just a fluke, then they will correct that. But we can't like do everything for someone, right? We've got to be met halfway. I think it's okay to offer people patience and understanding, but we have to expect a certain level of sweetness in return. Because if we're just constantly offering patience and understanding to people that haven't shown us or given us any reason to believe that they're deserving of that understanding and patience, then we're just letting ourselves be taken advantage of. So it's a balance, right? Because you want to set your boundaries, uh, think about what it is that you want and how you want to be treated and make sure that the people that you're dating and pouring time into are meeting those standards. And I also think it's good to be understanding and patient with people and understand that like Rome wasn't built in a day and things pop up and there's a lot of gray area situations that are going to arise within the dating process, right? You're the only one that's going to be able to suss out like where the line is for you in a changing situation. But I think overall, I see it as like there's a baseline level of understanding and patience that I think we owe other people just for the sheer fact that we're all imperfect people and know that shit pops up sometimes. But past that point, I do think that it's like there's a certain level of extended understanding and patience that needs to be earned. You know, if it's hard to nail down time for a second date because you've got like a crazy week and you're being really unresponsive on text, I'm happy to be understanding of that. And then once we get on that second date, if you cancel it last minute, I'm going to put my hands up and say, this is on them. If we go on a second date, they're going to be the one to plan it and put in that effort because I'm not going to continue offering understanding and patience and like bending over backwards to try to get on this date if this person's not also showing up for me in that way. It's good to be a sweetie, but also I think there's like, there needs to be a line with what we're willing to be patient for and understanding for that is appropriate with the level that we know this person. And obviously my opinion changes when we're talking about friends, family members, people that we have close relationships with, then I think my, my threshold for understanding and patience obviously gets much wider. But when it's strangers that we don't know very well, um... I'm I'm thinking we don't go over the baseline. We give a baseline level that I think is just a human level, but let's not go above and beyond for people we don't know that haven't proven that they are worth all that just yet. As a general rule of thumb, I feel like if a situation is making you feel like shit because you are offering patience and understanding, that is not a situation you need to be extending more patience and understanding in. If it's not making you feel good, if it's making you upset, if it's hurting your feelings, then like 
for sure you don't need to be doing all that. I understand your worry about going like too far in either direction, but I think that, um, you know, your body is telling you, your emotional reactions are telling you where your boundaries are. And I think it's a good thing to listen to them. Okay, so I went on a first date with a guy and it seemed to be going really well. He was really cute and I was feeling good about it. At the end of the date, he asked if he could kiss me, which I appreciated. And he said yes and we made out for a while. And then he shoved my finger... I'm sorry. And then he shoved his fingers down my throat and said, you'd look so pretty with my dick in your mouth. Hmm. Is this normal for a first date? No. <laughs> What makes it even more puzzling is we had both selected looking for a long-term relationship on our Hinge profiles. Listen, I'm all for getting freaky and doing dirty talk and stuff, but wrong place, wrong time, right? Like we hadn't established that kind of dynamic in any way whatsoever. It just made me sad because I feel like it's so hard to find something sweet and wholesome and that's what I want. Would you find this hot or would you feel like me in this scenario? I'm curious. Um, Yeah, I'd feel like you in this scenario and I, I know that some people will hear stories like this and be like, that's insane. Like who would act like that? This has got to be made up. And I'm here to tell you that you'd be shocked how many people do behave like this. Um, I've never met anyone off hinge that acted like this. It's interesting to me how different cities have like, uh, like preference to the apps, but I've definitely met some people off tinder when i was on tinder in college first of all you'd have to like hold me at gunpoint and waterboard me and like i don't know strap me to a wall to get me to download tinder now it just like you'd have to i I, there's just there's no world where you can get me to go on tinder there's not um and it's because when i was on tinder in college a lot of people on tinder this was like the crowd that tinder attracted where people on tinder might put that they're looking for a long-term relationship or they're looking to like actually date but then I don't know what I always felt it was I think in my head I was like if you show even like a little bit of confidence and you have tits people are just like I can sexualize her or like if you're on a date and things are going well and they can see like you know we've got a little bit of banter maybe we talk about something sexual or maybe they watch my YouTube videos and they know that it's like a topic that I'm comfortable with and because like the door opens in one way. They just think they can kick the whole fucking door down. And I think kissing is sort of the same way. Like they think, okay, we just kissed. The door is cracked open. Let me bust the whole thing in. And it makes no sense to any of us that have like reasonable uh, like boundaries and expectations when it comes to interacting with new people that we're dating. But unfortunately, I think that a lot of men just feel like entitled to sexualizing um women and the first sign that you give them that you could potentially be that for them some of them like have I don't know they just kick the door down it is ridiculous there's like no explanation for it that makes complete sense to me because that is how it always felt to me too like we had a sweet date a sweet conversation and then all of a sudden they're like you know we're waiting for the uber outside and they're like how about you come back to my apartment and I face fuck you and I'm like whoa what the fuck <laughs> But it's like, I don't know. I just like batted my eyelashes a little too hard and he took it sexually. And I was like, I was just looking to make out. What the fuck? It's like some people escalate it. And it's like, I was flirting with you for like a little kiss and for fun. And you were flirting with me because you were trying to do BDSM on date one. (sighs) It's insane. And it's totally inappropriate. And I understand why that made you feel the way that it did. It would have made me feel the same way. And ultimately I just want to validate you and saying that that's like an insane thing for a person to do to have like a sweet date to kiss you and then put their fingers down your throat and say that it would look good and say that you'd look good sucking their dick. That's insane. And, um, you're totally not alone in feeling like that's out of line. Cause it is. And people are fucking bizarre and weird and um yeah I'm really sorry that happened but you are not alone on that front I don't know dude I'm glad I haven't run into anyone like that since college this is also the freedom I feel with not being on dating apps anymore (laughs) I'm just like yeah don't be meeting people like that and thank god because y'all are freaks y'all are fucking freaks I am going to see 
problemista in like an hour. So I've got to uh, finish cleaning up my apartment, hang out with my girl, give her some quality time before I head to the movies with my friends. So thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks for hanging out. Hope you had a good time. Just absolutely getting into the Oscars and some silly little Addison Ray things with me. Um, I love you guys so much. Thank you so much for listening, and I will see you in the next episode.